it is January 21st in the brand new year. It's getting a little wear on it now, but it's a brand new year, 2024. Now, you don't have to answer this out loud, but how's it going so far? You know, on January 1st or December 31st at about 12.06 a.m., those resolutions sounded pretty good, didn't they? I'm going to do this. I'm going to quit that. I'm going to be this. I'm not going to be that anymore. That's three weeks ago. How's it going? Everything going all right? So here we are, and we've been talking about the new year this month. Usually we do a one-off message on the new year. It's kind of what we do in the traditional church, okay? But I wanted to take all of January and talk about the new year. And we've talked already about different aspects of promising God things. And we've talked about priorities and setting priorities. And this morning, we're just going to basically talk about living life. And this message is, is not just for a new year. We could preach this at any time in the year. Because frankly, the new year is kind of a thing we created on our calendar. It's just another day. And oftentimes we say, well, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in the new year. And preachers all over the world encouraged followers of Christ to, to give that new year, if it is given to them, back to the Lord again. And we make broad promises and we set high priorities. Because frankly, our goal, at least mine, I hope yours is, and I hope mine is, I, I hope I do it right is that if God gives us a new year to live for Him. I mean, it stands to reason, doesn't it? If you've met the Savior, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, if you've encountered the living God through Jesus Christ, and if you've come to Him and bowed in humble surrender as you confessed your sin to Him, confessed your inability and powerlessness to save yourself, and as you place your full faith and confidence on this great and grand risen Savior, and you got saved, and God's Spirit, as we talked about this, this morning in Sunday school, God's Spirit came and dwelt in you, and many, many things happened. You passed from death unto life. Instead of hell-bound, you're now heaven-bound. And as you surrender to Christ, or supposedly surrender to Him, and as you're faced with the prospect, and I use that word in quotes, of a new year, are you and I really going to live like we know the Savior? Are we really going to live as though God is actually real to us? Because honestly, there are times, instead of living like a believer in Jesus Christ, if we're not careful, if we're not alert, we're going to start living like an atheist. Oh, pastor, I would never do that. Oh, my goodness, never. No, no, no. Sometimes we get caught up. We get busy. We get focused on ourselves, our dreams, our goals, our troubles, our problems. Next thing you know, we're cruising through life as though there is no God and we don't know him and we've never met him. So this morning, we're going to encourage you to, instead of living like an atheist, which, let's face it, at times we have all been guilty of that, and we'll talk about how this works as we move through it this morning, we need to avoid, if, if we're a believer, if in fact we're a believer, if we're going to actually live according to what we say we believe, then that means, listen... That means we're going to look different from the rest of the world. And I'm not just talking about clothing styles and all that. I'm talking about values. I'm talking about motivation. I'm talking about purposefulness. In our Sunday school class this morning, we talked about the Holy Spirit's task is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. He's not, he didn't come to talk about himself. He'd come to promote you or me. The Spirit... His job is to promote and glorify Christ. Well, here's the thing. When you got saved, the Spirit of God moved in and dwelt inside of you. 
And one of his ministries is to glorify Christ in you and through you and me. However, if we go through life as, there, as though there is no God, how are, we, how are we doing that? You know, April Fool's Day is just three months plus away. Or less than that. I don't know. I'm not good at math. That's why I went to Bible college. <laughs> and it really makes me sad on social media on April Fool's Day. Number one, I tell my family, you are not allowed to April Fool Dad. Because number one, I don't like it. And number two, it appeals to my old nature to get back at you. And you don't like it. And I have to fight that, me and God. And he fortunately wins most of the time. But it really saddens me when people say, oh, this is the atheist holiday. And I'll be honest with you, in years past, I did that. I'm ashamed of it. And why do we say that? Well, in Psalm 14, we all Proverbs or Psalm, excuse me, Psalm 14, we all know what it says. You can quote it. You know, it's ironic. This is one of the few scriptures that Christians have memorized. And it's not because it means anything to them. They want to smack around unbelievers with it. And it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, that is true. Surrounded by the revelation of God in nature, surrounded by the revelation of God in his word, it is foolish to say there is no God. But you're not going to win any atheists by smacking them this with this passage and calling them a fool. If you do that, I'm going to correct you publicly. Don't do that. Yes, a fool says in his or her heart there's no God. That is foolish. But you know what? Hebrew is an interesting language. Because it can be translated that way. And we like it because we can beat up on the atheists. But here's the part we don't want to hear is it can also be translated, a fool said, says in his heart, no God. Did you hear that? A fool says in his or her own heart, no God. No. Now those of you who are parents and grandparents, and your children, you said, I need you to pick up your room. I need you to cut the grass. I need you to do X, Y, and Z. And imagine how you would feel if your child just looked up at you and said, no. Personally, I wouldn't be alive to preach this sermon today. <laughs> Yet over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, God calls his people to various tasks, missions, and ministry. God's Spirit impresses on various people things He wants them to do, places He wants them to go. And let me tell you about ministry. It's not pretty, it's not easy, it's inconvenient. But God is needing people in the ministry to do those things so we might bring glory to God. But more often than not, we say, no, God, no. And even just living life as though there is a God that exists, a God who influences our decisions, our values, Instead of living like God exists, we live like atheists in the world. We chase after the baubles and the bangles. We chase after our flesh. And in doing so, we say, no, God. And here's the thing. It starts with decisions and choices. That's why this whole New Year's idea is interesting. Because it gives us an opportunity to investigate our choices and decisions. And we're planning this new year and we've made our plans. Oh, we're going to go on this trip. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to gain weight, whatever your thing is. I'm going to give this. I'm going to do that. And I want to ask you, did you go and seek God's approval? As you're planning to spend your time and spend your energy and spend your money, have you gone to the Lord to get His okay? Because if we're doing these things and we don't, we're living like an atheist. And God might have one direction for our lives. And you know what we do? We look at Him like a little petulant, petulant four-year-old and we say, No, God. Take your Bibles and join me in the book of James. James chapter 4. James is a great book. Well, of course, the whole Bible is a great book.
But in the Bible, there's theology and practicality, and they go hand in hand. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. God gives us theology and doctrine to educate the practice of life, to give us practical ways to live. And one of those is our plans in dealing with time. And James is a very practical book. James focuses on practicing what we believe. It's a wonderful book. Sit down sometime in the next few days and read it. It's not long. It won't take you that long. But James gives us practical instruction on how to put legs and hands to theology. James is also very challenging to those who really don't want to do that. So in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, he begins by saying, come now. Now that sounds very biblical, very love, come now. Let me translate that in current modern English. Listen up. Listen up. Hey, it's kind of what God's doing. Come now, listen up. There's some things I want to tell you. You see, if we live like an atheist and we consider ourselves and maybe our believers, there's actually some sin involved in that. He said sin. Nobody uses the word sin anymore. That's an old-fashioned word. Really? Sin is sin. And it just means, as we discussed in Sunday school, it means like an archer pointing an arrow at a bullseye and missing Sin is just missing the mark of God's perfection. That's what it is. Greek, Greek word hamartiano for sin. It's an archer's term. And I believe everybody in this room that claims the name of Christ, you, you truly in your heart want to avoid sin. I don't believe there's anybody in here, at least I hope not, who calls themselves a Christian and says, man, I can't wait to get out of here. I'm going to go sin. I got some sin planned. We got some big sin next weekend. I don't think we do that. I don't think anybody here wants to do that. But when we plan and chart our lives apart from God, who is supposed to be the Lord of our lives, then yeah, we sin. And we're going to talk about three specific sins this morning that James brings up. And the first one is the sin of assumption. The sin of assumption. Have you ever made an assumption about something? You assumed somebody was going to do something and they didn't do it. You made an assumption about a business. Oh, I believe they're up and up and they weren't. Assumptions can be very dangerous. Living a life like an atheist is, is, is involves a sin of assumption. Look what James says. He said, listen up. And he's pointing at a crowd and he's saying, listen up, you who say today or tomorrow. We will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Now he's talking to people who are planning and making plans. And here's the thing, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but there's nothing wrong with making plans. Not a thing wrong with making plans. Nor is there anything wrong with making a profit. Nothing wrong with making a profit. There's nothing wrong with making plans. There's nothing wrong with making a plan to profit. I'm amazed at people who talk about how, you know, making a profit is a sin. No, it's not. What's a sin is when we do it apart from God and we assume that it's okay. He says in verse 14, he says... Listen, you who say today we'll go into such a city, stay there a year, buy, sell, make a profit. And they're all looking at each other going, what's wrong with that? Well, verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Have you ever stopped to think about that? What is your life? He goes on to say, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. He likens time to a vapor. What is a vapor? Well, you know what a vapor is. It's the mist 
that comes off your hot coffee cup. It doesn't hang around. You don't walk through the office and say, hey, there's Jane's mist from her coffee three weeks ago. Oh, wow, she had coconut mocha. That was good. <laughs> mist is very misty. It disappears. God is, a, God is a God who created time for us. It's a created thing. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't stop. I'm always amazed at, at people in my generation because we look at people in some of your younger generations and we look at you and say, you better be careful. Time goes by fast. Some of you young people, I hear it. Amen. Be careful. I haven't finished this illustration yet. And we shake our fingers at the young people and say, oh, time goes by fast. Man, I remember when I was your age and now I'm my age and boy, it just went by. And you know what? That's true. But we like to wag our fingers and point that out. Ha, ha, ha. See? Well, let me tell you my generation. Here's the secret, all you people that amen me. Time hasn't slowed down for you and me. It's still misty. And while we shake our fingers and tell the young people, soon you're going to vibe, you're going to be just like me. Listen, <laughs> soon time is going to go by and you and I are going to be standing before our maker before we know it. Let's take up an offering and go home. That's, that's encouraging. No. <laughs> I'm amazed at how grumpy and grouchy some of my generation can be and how mean they can be when here's the thing, y'all. We're closer to judgment than they are. We're going to be standing before God and He is going to look at you and look at me and say, what did you do? Time is a vapor. It comes and it goes. Yes, young people, give them the most of it. Make the most of it for God because it does go by fast. But older people, it's going by fast for us too. God didn't tell us to sit and watch it float by because we believe in what is called the myth of tomorrow. Tomorrow is a myth, by the way. Here's the reality. Tomorrow doesn't even exist right now. Tomorrow is a myth. It does not exist. We've mentioned this a couple times already. God forbid something happened to one of us and we don't have a tomorrow. As a matter of fact, this afternoon doesn't exist yet. It is a myth. And we, not, we might not know what might happen within the next few hours. December 7th, 1941, people's alarm clocks went off at 6 o'clock. It was time to get up, go to church, get up and get ready for the day. They thought it was just another day in paradise. And the Empire of Japan decided to attack a few minutes later. And all of their plans were gone. And thousands of young men died on ships in the Hawaiian harbor at Pearl Harbor. I don't need to give any more illustrations, do I? Here's the thing about living with the Lord and walking with Him and being eternally minded. Eternally, eternity is no time. Eternity is the forever now. Do you realize when we get to heaven and all things are resolved and we get in the holy city and God ends, there will be no more time. But that's not a bad thing. You say, I can't comprehend it. Neither can I, but that's the way it is. You're not guaranteed a tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed a tomorrow. We pour all of our, all our stuff in tomorrow, all of our bags, and we forget the mistiness of time. It's not something you count on. Time is not something you are to rely on. Time is something you are to use and get through. And if God wills, as we will see, you will have a tomorrow or this afternoon. We often put off till tomorrow. We plan for tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring this. Even in the musical Annie, there's the, the sun will come out tomorrow. Really? Will it? Now, I'm not trying to scare anybody, and I'm not trying to be Donnie Downer, but I'm just telling you, there is no... Right now, as we sit here in this auditorium in Concord, North Carolina, there is no tomorrow. Unless God allows a tomorrow. It's a myth. Due to the mistiness of time, we're not guaranteed that. 
So what should we do? Instead of saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to lose weight. Tomorrow I'm going to join the church. Tomorrow I'm going to, tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. I love this gentleman. His name is, and I probably get it, going to pronounce his name wrong, but his name is Israel Moore Ayavor. And he's a North African Christian. And he's a preacher and a motivator for the things of God. And he says this. He said, you can dance in the storm. In other words, people don't do stuff now because it's a mess. You know, there are people that didn't go to church this morning because it was too cold. Y'all are amazing. You braved the cold and got, when I woke up, it was 16 degrees in Harrisburg. I got out of the bedroom. Susan's cats looked at me and they said, it's cold, man. There are people this morning who made the decisions, oh, it's too cold, I'm not going to do it. There are people who would do X, Y, and Z, but they say, well, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's raining. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll serve the Lord tomorrow. I'll be a missionary tomorrow. I'll teach tomorrow. Well, you can dance in the storm, even if it's storming. Don't wait for the rain to be over before, <clears throat> over before because it might take too long. You can do it now. Wherever you are, right now you can start. Right now, this is the very moment. What is he trying to say? He says, if you're going to make any decisions, do it now. Because tomorrow may not come. Or if tomorrow does come, the plans that you made might be overturned. I get up some mornings, plan to drive into the office, flat tire, car won't start. Small things like that. Get up and plan to go to the office, plan to go to school. You never know what's going to happen. We don't have tomorrow. We need to decide now. What are you going to be for Christ now? What are you going to do now? Bless God that you're here now. And I believe God blesses us when we, you're gathered here. God bless you for being here now. There are some people who chose not to be. Oh, I'll go to church next Sunday. I'll go to church next week. You're here now. There is no tomorrow unless God gives it. So it's the sin of assumption. I just have tomorrow's going to come. I assume that I'm going to have it tomorrow. Even when we celebrate New Year's, we're making the assumption that we're going to have a new year. And I hope to heaven we do. But what if we don't? Better to say, I'm glad I did than I wish I had. The sin of assumption Tomorrow's a myth, and time is misty. It comes and goes. Boom. There's also the sin of arrogance. The sin of arrogance. Let's read on. Go down to verse 15. He said, listen, what is your life? As we finish up verse 14 quickly. What is your life? And let me, let me go ahead before we move on and ask you that question. What is your life? What is your life? That's a big, broad, pregnant, open question, isn't it? If you sit there right now in this moment, because this moment's all you got, this moment's all I have, and I ask this question, what is your life? What are you thinking right now in your mind? What is your spirit telling you? Is your life everything it needs to be before God? You're a believer. You say you believe in Jesus. Do you? Is your life what God needs it to be? You say, oh, no, because if you're honest, you're like me. and Oh, it needs to be better. Well, what are you doing? Well, next week I plan to, next year we're going to, next, no. What about now? Now is decision time. Now is the time. You don't have tomorrow. You ain't, you ain't got time to make, wait. What is your life? It's vaporous. It's misty. So instead of sitting there saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, he says in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Again, there's nothing wrong with making plans. There's nothing wrong with setting goals. As a matter of fact, I personally think it's a good thing. You need something to shoot for because if you don't shoot for it, if anything, you'll be a pro if you, Let me get this right. As my dean of my college once said, if you shoot for nothing, you'll hit it. If you shoot for nothing, you'll hit it. So yes, we should have goals. We should have plans. But at the end of the day, if we get a day to have an end, 
We need to go to the Lord and seek his face about those plans and goals. It's what the book of Proverbs says. The book of Proverbs says a man's heart plans his way. Yeah. But look at the next sentence. But the Lord directs his steps. We make our plans, but the Lord's ultimately sovereign. And we need to make sure that our plans are agreeable to his word and with him. We need to submit to him because God may not want us to do X, Y, or Z. He may want us to do A, B, and C. And I don't know about you, but God's changed my plans a few times. Has he done that to you? <laughs> Can I tell you a little secret? I probably told this before. When I was in Bible college and soon as I graduated, year I got graduated, I got ordained into the ministry. And at that point, I never wanted to pastor a church. As a matter of fact, for the next four or five, I didn't want to be the pastor of a church. I was going to be content being on staff somewhere, being the music director or the youth director or the education director. I told Susan when we started dating and we talked about getting married, I said, look, dear, I'm just going to be a staff. I'm not going to be able to afford to buy you a house. And the insane woman married me anyway. But honestly, I did, even when I was here at West Concord on staff as music and youth minister, I didn't want to be the pastor of West Concord. When Dr. Poor left, we began looking, and I was looking too. But God had other plans. I'm sorry. God may change your plans through sickness. God may change your plans through finances. God may change your plans in some way or another. That's why it's so important. We talk about Jesus being the Lord of our lives. And I hear people say, you need to make him Lord of your life. He's Lord of your life, whether you make him that or not. What you need to do is surrender to that lordship. And say, God, this is your life, not mine. Do whatever you want with me. Remember Jesus' prayer in the garden? When he was facing the cross, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. I'd have been praying that prayer too. But he ended that prayer in a way that I might not have. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We need to surrender unto the Lord. Instead, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And if the Lord wills for us not to do that, we can be fine with that. We can be fine with that. I'm finishing up a doctoral degree. You realize I started a doctoral degree 26 years ago? I was going to get a Ph.D. I had already enrolled. I had already started the classes. I was reading the books, not understanding anything, but I was doing it. And you know what happened? <laughs> I became a D.A.D. And every bit of money and time went into that situation. I had people, one lady go, what is a D.A.D.? I said it is a doctor of adolescent development. That's what it is. But instead of surrendering to the Lord, oftentimes we swagger before the Lord. He says, instead, we ought to say, if the, Lord, uh, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. But verse 16, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. In other words, when we make plans and we set goals as believers apart from God, we're living like atheists. We're swaggering before the Lord. Lord, I'm going to do this. Lord, I'm going to be that. Whether you like it or not. And even if we don't do that intentionally, that's what we're doing in reality. As we have this new year, and we're only three weeks into it, what is your life, this vaporous existence? And what are you planning to do with it? And that is the sin of arrogance. We ought to be saying, if the Lord wills, we will do this and that. But instead, we say, no, I will. And Lord, you can just go away. But we forget that, yes, a man's heart plans his ways. Huh. But the Lord's going to direct his steps. So there's the sin of assumption. We think that we got it tomorrow. And hopefully we do, and I think mostly we do, but I could be wrong. I'd be blessed to get it tomorrow. I'm excited about tomorrow if it comes. But all I have and all you have is right now. If we assume anything else, 
we're not trusting in the Lord. The sin of, that, the sin of arrogance. We need to surrender unto the God's lordship, but instead we swagger before him. And then finally, there's the sin of apathy. And I'm afraid that's one of the biggest sins in Christendom today. The sin of apathy. You know what apathy is? A reporter once walked up to a man on the street and put a microphone and said, Sir, can you define apathy? He said, I don't care. There you go. Many Christians just bounce through life like a pinball on a pinball machine from one shiny thing to another. And this is how James says it. He said, look, you who go out and say, I'm going to make all these plans, make all this money, I'm doing all this. He said, huh, you better be careful because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. What you ought to say is if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Again, nothing wrong with planning and setting goals. But we need to run it through the permissive will of God's hand first. And trust him when he turns the table on us because he might have other plans for us. But oftentimes we just get apathetic. He says in verse 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good... And does it not, or does not do it, to him it is sin. When we think of sin, missing God's mark, we think of sins of commission. Drinking, drugging, chasing women, chasing men, whatever. Cheating on our income taxes. We think of all those sins. Being ugly, telling a lie, and they are sins. We think of the sins that we do, but how about the things that we don't do? Sins of omission. Things we know we ought to do, but we don't. Things that we know. Listen, I've been here at this church come next month 33 years. And we'd have aisle invitations. And people ask me, well, why don't we have altar calls anymore? Well, we do when I feel like it's necessary, as God leads me. But I can't tell you how many altar calls at West Concord. And people on the internet, if I disappear from the camera, I'm sorry. It's a blessing, don't worry. <laughs> but we have people, we have the altar call. And people come forward. And you know, there have been a lot of people who've come forward and they really fulfilled. But I've had people come forward and they're weeping and crying. And then Monday comes and it's like nothing happened. We make promises to God like New Year's resolutions. And we don't fulfill them. God has given us commandments. God has given us direction. God has given us leading. And we live like atheists as though he said nothing. And we become apathetic. We become apathetic or uncaring to the fact that you have people in your neighborhood who don't know Jesus as Savior. And they're not promised a tomorrow either. And if they die in that condition, they will spend an eternity in hell separated from God. We have people in our lives that are struggling, our brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe our own families, not knowing Christ, or they're walking away from Christ. But we're too busy at the job. We're too busy at the hobby. We're too busy fill in the blank. And we're not going to them and helping them. Oh, we came forward that Sunday morning. We gave our life to Jesus. And then we turned around and took it right back. See, here's the thing, y'all. We're talking about a new year. And if you've made your plans, great, but where is God in that? Because if you fail to go to God and take those plans, fail to seek His face, fail to surrender and submit to Him, you say, I haven't done anything wrong. You haven't done anything right either. Apathy is one of the greatest sins in the church today, in my opinion. Oh, we care about different things. We care about traditions in the church. We care about music in the church. We care about this and that. We care about politics. Would to God we would have that much passion for the lost and for the broken. So, listen. These are the sins that are part of living like an atheist. And I'm not here to slam atheists. I want them to know Christ desperately. And some of the nicest people I've ever met are atheists. That's why I cringe when I hear people say, Atheists, that's their day, April Fool's Day. 
Sometimes I think Christians demonstrate more foolishness than atheists. But when we who believe in Christ, when we who claim Christ live as though we got the rest of our lives mapped out ahead of us and don't take it to God, we commit the sin of assumption. Instead of surrendering to the Lord and swaggering before Him, we commit the sin of arrogance before God. And we get to the place we really don't care anyway. It's apathy. Jesus also knew this. Jesus also addressed everything about tomorrow. Because the sun may not come out tomorrow. And he said this about tomorrow. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34 in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. I, I'm guilty of this. I'm having an issue. I'm dealing with something. I've got a debt. I've got a thing going on that I don't want to go to. And I fret and I worry and I get upset and I nurse, rehearse all the problems. And the reality is, what if I don't live till tomorrow? I'm ruining now. <laughs> tomorrow will take care of tomorrow's stuff. I've got only now. Let's keep now nice. Let's keep now joyous. Whatever's going on is, is Israel and more. Erevor said, dance in it. Let tomorrow worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Haven't you got enough trouble today? I always get amazed when I watch war movies. World War II. And, and sometimes in those war movies, you know, fights break out in the platoon. And, and Marines and soldiers and are beating up on each other. And the, and the commander usually says, aren't the Nazis enough? Do you have to fight with one another? Do you have to beat up each other? We got, don't, do you not have enough war? Listen, my brother and sister in Christ, isn't today got enough stuff in it? Don't you have enough struggle today just to get through? Don't worry about tomorrow. You may not have it. Don't live in the sin of assumption. Not only that, but isn't there enough stuff to enjoy today? We think, well, I'll, I'll, my life will get better when I get this. My life will get better when I have that. My life, listen, what's wrong with your life right now? How many people are here this morning? Okay. You're here. How many people at breakfast this morning, as Howard used to say? How many people are help planning, you planning to eat lunch? Hey, church council, man, we're eating good this afternoon. Don't you wish you were one of us? If we have it this afternoon. Ha <laughs> see, I caught myself. Enjoy now. Suck all the joy out of now. And surrender to Christ now. Because you don't know if you'll have a tomorrow. So let's put it all in one bag here. Again, the Sermon on the Mount. A little earlier in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. Or what's called the Lord's Prayer. It's a model prayer. God gives us guidance on how we kind of should direct our prayers. And one of the lines in the so-called Lord's Prayer is simply this. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us to now, today, right now, our daily bread. Is that enough? Yes, it's okay to make plans. Yes, it's okay to set goals. Yes, it's okay to chart things and do things. But always remember, you're not guaranteed a tomorrow. Always remember that God is sovereign. And while you make your plans, He's going to order your steps. And sometimes that ordering is not going to be according to your plan. So what we ought to do, instead of swaggering before Him in our own arrogance, we ought to submit to His Lordship. And in that faith, trust Him for whatever comes as we move forward. Instead of moving through life saying, whatever. Go through life humble before him in every decision, every moment. Content and happy with what you have now. Because here's the thing. If we can get a hold of that eternal mindset. If we choose to be joyful in the moment. Then every moment will be joyful. Even the difficult ones. And instead of living like God doesn't exist, like an atheist, we are moment by moment loving him, celebrating him, and depending upon him. And our prayer should be, give us this day our daily bread. Standing and heads are bowed as we close. Again, right now is now.
It's all we have now. God forbid something would happen that we would not have uh, this afternoon or tomorrow. And I would love to be able to tell you, yeah, don't worry, tomorrow's coming. The sun will come out tomorrow. Maybe, maybe not. I, I hope. I hope. I'm not trying to be, again, negative or a downer. I'm just, I'm just trying to look at life in reality. Make your plans. Set your goals. Chart out a new year, but understand this. You will only and I will only get a new year as God grants us that new year. It's all in his hands. God has already lived our lives with us, through us. He's lived your life with you since, since before you were born. And he's already lived your life with you until you die. He has your life in his hands, literally. So it makes sense to trust in the one who's been there, done that, and has your life. We become arrogant and selfish and self-righteous when we try to walk apart from him. If you're making plans in the new year, I pray that you'll make plans that will glorify God and you'll enjoy your family. You'll go on trips. You'll, you'll do business. But seek God's face in the doing, in the going, and in the planning. One of the things a little old lady taught me years ago, and I'm sure she didn't make it up because I've heard it from other people. But this has been my prayer every decision I have to make. I still pray this prayer. And it sounds trite and it sounds cliche, but I pray this. When I'm praying with a decision, I pray something like this. Lord, open the doors you want me to go through and close the doors you don't. That's a simple prayer, but it's what I rely on. I would encourage you to adopt that prayer and trust God when he does shut the doors. Because if God shuts the door, it's for your good because he loves you. Father, we thank you for this time together. Father, we thank you that we have had years past, some of us more years than others. But Father, regardless of whether we're very young or very old, time moves at the same speed. It's a vapor. It comes and goes. It doesn't linger. And Father, oftentimes time gets past us and we haven't utilized it for your glory. Father, we've arrogantly stolen time for our sake. Give us the grace as we move into, if you give us a new year, as we move into a new year, to surrender this year to you, to give this new year to you. Father, I pray in my life that if you grant me the year 2024, that you would help this all too human stumbling man to give it to you. I pray for this new year for West Concord Baptist Church. If you give us this new year, may we surrender all our wants. May we surrender all our preferences and give this church and this year to you. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here now before you, worshiping the God whom we claim is holy, holy, holy. As we walk away from this place, may we not walk away from that worship. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here.